Hey, my name's Kat and you're watching The Creative Introvert. And today I've got an episode for you all about the value of embracing your diamond. So I've got, this is a, an extra bonus episode today. Um, you've already had an episode this week, but I thought I'd add an extra one in just because um, I'm, you know, working up to beginning my new course on embracing your diamond That's starting on Sunday, May 16th. So you've still got a few days left to sign up for that course. But um, I thought I would just like have a little reminder in this episode, um, as well as some stuff that um, I don't quite cover in the course, but I think is good, like preliminary material for understanding this topic of the diamond, if I haven't spoken enough about it already. So um, just before I get into the meat of today's show, uh, here are just some details about the course that's coming up starting Sunday. So uh, for the next 12 weeks, every Sunday we'll be meeting live online on Zoom um, and we'll be diving into the world of the diamond. So this will be happening at Sundays at 3 p.m. UK time. It's 10 a.m. Eastern and you can figure out the, the rest, hopefully. Um, so the classes are all about an hour long, so that's not a massive amount of time together, but I think... Um, the fact that we'll be meeting every week will really just be a nice part of our week, hopefully a nice way to wrap up our week, um, just to kind of come together and, and discuss this stuff. And I will be doing, um, you know, this is kind of like 80% teaching, 20% you um, having the option to share a little bit about your own daimonic experiences, as well as, um, you know, uh, interacting with me while we look at your astrological birth chart, because that's also going to be a big part of this course. Um, we're going to be looking for clues um, in your charts to do with the diamond. And I'll be teaching you various um, astrology techniques to get to get to know your diamond and the concept of the diamond in general in your life. Um, other than that, we'll also be doing a lot of philosophy around the diamond, what it is, how it shows up in different cultures, what it means to us personally. A lot of this is going to be um, you know, I, I, cause I don't have one answer to this. Um, this is all a very individual thing. And all I can do is hopefully provide some kind of path to, to work along to find your diamond. Um, and we'll also have a lot of practical tips because you know me, I like my one, two, three steps. So there will still be some, you know, practical insights that we can try out as well. So for much more information about that and to sign up before Sunday, um, you can go to thecreativeintrovert.com slash daimon, spelled D-A-I-M-O-N. Okay, so the daimon. First of all, just in case you need a reminder or you haven't heard my previous podcast on this or any of my workshops, um, what is the daimon? Well, the way I'm seeing it is it's a unique spirit that accompanies us from birth to death. Some say that it guides, some say that it protects some say that it inspires, and some say that it connects us with the divine. It's a go-between. It's a mediator of sorts. Um, it isn't quite a god, and it isn't quite a human. It lives in the in-between world. Uh, and finally, something to remember about the diamond is it remembers why we're here. And, and that's a lot of what we're going to be covering today in more depth. So the focus of today's show isn't so much about the what of the diamond, though. We Again, we do that on the in the course a lot more in, in depth. It's more about the why. Why embrace our diamond? Why get to know it in the first place? Why make this a part of your life? Why take my course? Um, you know, why would we acknowledge its existence? So for me, the question of why embrace your diamond or the value of it, um, it seemed kind of self-evident at first. I, it just, I didn't think I needed to explain it or um, go into it. But the more that I've um, been diving into the process of coming to know my diamond, embrace my diamond, um, which, you know, is, spoiler alert, it's, it's a daily practice. Um, but any daily, daily practice, you know, whether it's... Um, just showing up on the mat every day to do some yoga or uh, to meditate. It's hard. And we often need a bit of a something, something else that keeps us, keeps us coming back. And for me, it always comes back to the why. Now this why business, the, the business of finding your why for doing something um, is something that I've talked about already on a different different episodes of the show. Uh, and if you've caught any of those, you know that, well, it's not very straightforward. Um, finding your why uh, is, is, is a tricky one. 
And it's especially tricky if we don't really know much about the daimon to begin with, if we haven't ever had any practices around embracing our daimon, if we weren't taught how to do that at school, I don't know of any school teaching this stuff. So um, without having a lot of information around it, finding a why I think can be quite hard. And so again, this is what I'm trying to pull out in, in today's show is what what have the reasons been for people throughout history, for thousands and thousands of years, trying to contact this tutelary being, um, this this guiding force, this protective agent. Um, and I would like to just kind of give you a list of reasons. Here's why to connect with your daimon, but I think it will be more genuine if I can share with you my own process around finding my whys of connecting to the daimon. Because again, yours, yours actually could be different. Um, but this is kind of both my process and the kind of conclusions that I made around why why do this daimon work. So like I said, I've really enjoyed the research part of the daimon. I love old texts, myths, legends of yore. Um, and I like just thinking about fate and destiny, you know, the nature of free will. But the actual practice, the practice of, again, just daily showing up for the daimon, figuring out like, what do I need to do? You know, making myself quiet, finding a space for the diamond, um, making art with the diamond, all of these. And there are multiple practices and ways to do this. Um, some more complicated than others. Some are like are more like rituals. Um, but yeah, actually doing it, taking my own advice on this, like a lot of things is actually very difficult. Um, so like I said, it, it's, it's like any of these morning practices that I and, and many others, um, we know the value of, but it's it's just doing them. So whether that's morning pages, if you ever tried doing Julia Cameron's morning pages, you probably know how powerful it is, but also how challenging it is to, to actually do that consistently. And the only surefire way for me that I've been able to maintain any of my morning practices, and I'm totally like working on all of them, and it's never been consistent for, you know, None of them will ever be inf infinitely consistent. And I, I know that. But the thing that I tend to do with those is I try to remember my why. So for example, if I don't do some form of physical yoga practice, some practice um, in the morning, basically looks like some stretches. I'm not a, a great yogi. Um, I might be okay if I miss a day, maybe two. But after that point, um, it's highly likely time and time and time again, I'll, um, I'll like you know, do something to my neck. Um, I'll, my lower back will start to ache. I'll just mysteriously injure myself in just like stupid, clumsy ways when I haven't been practicing. So that's a bloody good reason. The reason to do yoga is because I don't want to hurt myself because when I don't do it, life is so much worse. Um, so it's not a fancy reason. It's, it's not even a particularly spiritual reason. In fact, it's really just like it to be uh, less injury prone. That said, there is another side effect. I do find that when I do my yoga practice, I um, am more able to have a, a silent um, meditation practice. I can, or any meditation practice really, um, but I'm, it, I find it easier to quieten my mind just after doing a physical practice. And that's exactly what uh, yoga asana was, was for. So, and with that, so let's, let's take my meditation practice. What if I miss a day or two of that? Well, again, this is when I start to see its negative effects. Um, I find myself to be more impatient. Um, I'm easier to distract. And I think the most you know, significant um, side effect of this is that I start to forget who I am and what I'm connected to. So, and, and this is kind of the spiritual part of this. And while I know that my spiritual connection to the divine will never fully go away, um, it can feel like it gets clouded over when when I don't return to this practice, and that kind of sucks. So all of this is to say that it's easier for me to remember my why when I remember my why not. What's the not just the carrot of the, the good reasons for doing these kind of practices um, and be all like kind of self righteous? What's the downside? What's the stick element of this? Um, <laughs> what happens when I don't do these things? And this kind of looks something like this. So with those examples, when I don't practice yoga daily, I hurt myself. Uh, and so that can become, that's my why, I practice yoga daily to stay pain-free. 
And you can also do a kind of domino effect with these. So how about this? If I don't practice yoga daily, I find it harder to meditate. If I don't meditate, I forget who I am and I become snappy, impatient cat. So that kind of if I don't becomes if I practice yoga daily, I can meditate daily. And if I meditate daily, I'm a nicer person to be around and I remember who I am and my connection to something much greater. So I guess that's the tip that I'm basing a lot of this episode around is if you don't have a why around the daimon, let me share with you, or maybe you want to reflect on what happens when you don't, when you don't embrace the daimon. Okay. So, um, let's, let's start with, these are just some of the ones that I've come up with, but you know, feel free to share your own. Um, number one is we start to feel like life lacks meaning. Okay. So when does life feel meaningless? Like, have you experienced this? Um, For me, this is when events feel random, disconnected from each other, kind of like we're just another sucker being blown in the wind, carried along by the winds of fate. It feels like there's no overarching purpose to our actions and our lives as wholes. And I don't know about you, but again, that feeling is just not good for me. Um, It's not good for me to think like that. And ultimately, I feel like it can be a very speedy path to nihilism. And ultimately, if I feel like my life is meaningless, then I'm going to assume that yours is too. And, you know, how am I going to treat people if I don't think that they're full of meaning and purpose and value? Probably not very nicely. So again, I just think for society in general, it's pretty good for us to have meaning in our lives. Okay. So, you know, that all sounds nice. It would be nice to like live in a in a meaningful world and feel our place in it but where does the diamond come in so one of the myths that gives the diamond form i think comes from um uh, plato who is one of the stories that he tells in the republic is the myth of Ur. so the myth of Ur is basically the tale of a man who um, a soldier i believe who gets um wounded and you know people think he's dead so they pop him on a funeral pyre, they're going to burn him. Um, but basically he, he, he wakes up. Um, he, he basically does kind of die, I guess. And he goes into this, um, like the other world, like the, the, the afterlife and, and sees the process of, of souls coming to earth. Um, and then he wakes up to tell his tale, but he, here's a little piece of it. When all the souls had chosen their lives, according to their lots, they went before Lachesis, and she sent with each, as the guardian of his life and the fulfiller of his choice, the diamond that had been chosen. Under her hands and under her turning of the spindle, the destiny of the chosen lot is ratified. Then the diamond again led the soul to the spinning of Atropos to make the web of its destiny irreversible. And then without a backward glance, the soul passes beneath the throne of necessity. So in Plato's myth, and I do recommend just Googling the myth of Ur and just, you know, reading it. Um, but in Plato's myth, we not only choose our life, we also choose an accompanying daimon, um, a being, a guide who remembers the life we chose and really wants us, it's its job to keep us to that path, to that life. And if you're somebody who believes in karma, you know, the law of cause and effect, maybe you see this as um, another way of looking at the idea of us choosing our life, because as far as I understand it, karma is we, we, we act and we get, um, you know, there's a result of our actions, whether we get it instantly or in in many lifetimes. So in, in many ways, we are choosing our lives through our actions. And the important thing about this myth isn't that we try to literally believe that it happened. I mean, Plato made it up. Uh, But that doesn't mean that it doesn't hold some very real and very big truths. And while I can't personally prove these truths to you, I can choose to believe in them myself and more importantly, act as though I believe them. So, and, 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 you know, I, I sort of emphasize that because you can believe something without it having any impact on your actions. Um, For example, somebody can believe that, yeah, it is wrong to eat animals, but yeah, they still go to KFC and eat the chicken burger, like whatever. 
So there are lots of things and no judgment there. I mean, I might do that myself, but basically there's, there's our beliefs and our actions and they're not always aligned. And I think with, with this, we have a choice. We actually have a choice to, to believe this myth and actually act like it too. So I'm kind of waffling now, but the important piece of this is that we can choose to believe that there is something deliberate chosen about this life, um, that each of our individual lives. And even though some, well, a lot of events can seem very random um, in the moment and meaningless, if we believe that there is an overarching story, just one that maybe we aren't clear on yet, you know, if we believe that something is calling to us, calling us to a certain path, everything starts to have meaning if we choose to, to see it that way. And we can act on, on the basis of that. So the trick really is just a perspective shift. You know, the shift is the difference between basically focusing on fate, shit that happens to us, versus focusing on destiny. And here's a fun thing. Fate and destiny aren't the same thing, which I kind of thought they were. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that. And as a way to understand this, I have this quote from a psychologist, I believe, called Alexander Lowen. He said, destiny or daimon, because destiny is basically another word for daimon, is related to the word destination. It refers to what we become, whereas fate or fortune or chance or dumb luck describes what one is. Fish are fated to swim as birds are fated to fly, but that is hardly their destiny. The oracle at Delphi did not foretell the destiny of Oedipus, which was to banish from the earth and find an abode with the gods. He prophesied his fate, which was that he would kill his father and marry his mother. So it doesn't mean that fate isn't real. Fate is, you know, the water that we swim in. It's, it's, the, it's us being able to swim or fly if we're a fish or a bird. But destiny is what I choose to make of fate. And moreover, how I choose to to live it, um, or even just seeing it, how I perceive it. So let's take being a redhead, right? So this is part of my fate. Um, and let's say there is somebody, and um, this isn't me, but like, let's say there is a fellow redhead and um, they were bullied at school because of their hair color, um, which sucks. And later in life, they start, so they start a support group for fellow gingers, um, carrot tops, Rangers, as Jonah says. How is it okay for you to bully Ben? Because he's a ranger. A what? A ranger, sir. Because he's got red hair, a ranger team. Yeah. That's what we call him. And through that support group, they meet the love of their life, a fellow fiery redhead who supports them in their cause. And they go on to keep the diminishing population of redheads um, going. Okay, so how that redhead made the most of their fate or how their fate became their destiny, for me, is basically a choice. And it's the only choice, I think, that we have in this life. You know, what, what do we make of it? And a lot of it, sure, is, you know, how do we act with what we've got? But I think, again, even more than that is, is how are we perceiving what we've got? How are we perceiving the events of our life so far? And if you aren't sure where the mark of destiny is in your current life, you can always look optimistically into the future and think, okay, well, maybe this, I, I'm not clear about what the story is right now, but at some point it will become clear. And again, that's just a kind of faith. There's, there's no proof that that's going to work out for you. Maybe, you know, you get run over tomorrow and that would suck and, you know, you wouldn't have figured it out. And, and but that's okay too. Um, I just think if, we, if we're going to go about this life, um, it's, it's a pretty good way to, to act, acting as if. Um, and a great book to read around this is Michael Mead's uh, Fate and Destiny. Um, yeah, I'll have, I've got a bunch of book recommendations around this subject, which I go more into on the course, got tons of them. But just for today, Michael Mead, Fate and Destiny. So again, choosing destiny is a choice. Or in other words, choosing daimon is a choice, right? Because daimon, destiny, that they, they were used interchangeably. So to sum this up, when I don't embrace my daimon, life feels like it has no meaning. So that's like the stick end of it. So how could I change that? Like, you know, what happens if I don't do it into a, into a why? So my first why is I embrace my diamond because it gives life meaning. Whoa, that's a pretty big one. I could end there, but I've got two more. So number two is 
We are distressed by the slings and arrows of fate. So this is what happens when you don't embrace your diamond. We're distressed by the slings and arrows of fate. So even if we are on board on this whole destiny business and, you know, where we're acting as if and all of that, it's still perfectly natural and understandable to be distressed by fate, the shit that happens to us. And you just need to listen to some Alanis Morissette lyrics just to kind of get a feel of, of, of how this feels. You know, it's like rain on your wedding day. It's a free ride when you've already paid. It's that good advice that you just didn't take. Uh, I think this is like maybe the second time that I've quoted Alanis Morissette on the podcast. But anyway, I just think it's a good, uh, it's a really good song filled with examples of like the way I understand it, why life sucks sometimes. But what if we could know in advance what was going to happen to us? Maybe we can't change what happens to us, but what if we could know in advance? Could it change how we respond to what happens? Uh, And again, I think this is choosing destiny. And what if we could see, you know, and this would be the ideal thing, right? What if we could see into a mirror that actually describes, assuming that we could understand the language of the mirror, actually describes the nature of these slings and arrows? You know, and, and if we could do that, wouldn't it be nice to be able to ride them out in, in a smoother way, knowing that it's, we're in for a bumpy ride, surely we're going to be more likely to ride, ride it out. Ptolemy, many <laughs> thousands of years ago, uh, sums this up. One must consider that even for the events that result from necessity, just like fate, the unexpected is very apt to produce both deranged confusion and excessive joy. But foreknowing accustoms and composes the soul. Foreknowing accustoms and composes the soul. Cool. And this is very much the stoic perspective on life. Um, again, a couple of thousand years ago, um, around the, the dawn of you know Western Hellenistic astrology, the goal was to have a composed soul, to not get swept so high on the highs of life or get pulled down by the, the lows of life. The aim was to sail smoothly through, regardless of whether the sea was really stormy or whether it was really calm. And it's kind of just like, you know, if you check, if you're somebody who checks the weather forecast, and if you live in the UK, you often do this, and you'd like to talk about it a lot, um, you can make a choice if you see a little rain cloud on your app uh, that you're going to bring a, an umbrella that day. Or maybe you, you don't pay attention to it and, you know, it's kind of your fault. But basically, the fact that we can foreknow something or even just get a rough idea of something um, can help us choose something better and, and not freak out so much. So what tools do we have to allow this? Do we have um, an app that can tell us you know, what the forecast is for our fate? Yes, we do. We literally do. That's what astrology is. Amazing, right? Um, so that's, you know, and it's not for everyone, but I've made my choice and I, I think astrology is a pretty good mirror for this. So, uh, and it might not be that for you. Maybe it's tarot or um, entrails and something like that. But um, divination has, has been used for this very purpose for, for thousands of years. So where does the daimon fit into this? Um, you know, is the daimon related to this foreknowing? Actually, yes, it is like very much. So I'm going to quote now from Dorian Greenbaum's book, uh, The Daimon in Hellenistic Astrology, because this really gets into, um, and I am doing this, coming at this from the mind again, but like basically it really does get into the um, the interplay of, of, of daimon and destiny and fate and all of that good stuff. So she said, Socrates' daimon is compared to Athena in the Iliad as something that alone showed him the way, illumining his path in matters and non sorry in matters dark and non rational to human understanding. Thus, the daimonic illumines, like the astrological sun and moon, the luminaries who rule sight, physical and mental insight, eyes and foreknowing. The daimon brings us what we already know, which only needs to be brought to consciousness and light which the daimon can provide. And the more we follow and are encouraged by the, our daimon, the more our phronesis, which is basically a wisdom that leads to the right action, increases. In Timaeus, phronesis grows in power as one cultivates one's daimon. And here's a quote within a quote from the Timaeus. 
But he who has seriously devoted himself to learning and to true thoughts, Phrenesis, and has exercised these qualities above all his others, must necessarily and inevitably think thoughts, Phronine, that are immortal and divine, if he lays hold of the truth. And inasmuch as he is forever tending his divine part and duly magnifying the daimon who dwells along with him, he must be especially high spirits, eudaimon. So, and this is me talking now, end of quote. So if we tend to that divine part within us and magnify the daimon that dwells alongside us, we gain this wisdom, this phronesis, and basically this results in the highest possible action. And I think this is important because we live in a world of matter and we have to act. We have to respond to the basic facts of life. You know, we have to respond to our need to um, eat food, to continue to live. The choice whether to eat the food or to not eat the food is still an action. It's still a choice. Um, and so to me, it makes sense that the more knowledge that we have of the lay of the land, what we're dealing with, the... the our fate, um, which I see as evidence in my birth chart, um, and as well as the the current astrological sky, the more of this phrenesis kind of wisdom I have access to. So a kind of knowing and insight that actually leads to practical action. So this is also what the daimon actually helps us with. And maybe the daimon is what allows us to speak the language of astrology, who knows, may, or any divinatory art. Maybe you don't just use one of those tools. Maybe you just need um, your intuition. Maybe the diamond speaks very directly to you. You know, and that's very similar to what I, I believe Socrates had with his diamond. Either way, that channel, um, which I'm kind of thinking of as our relationship with the diamond, that needs to be kept open. It needs to be tended to in the same way that if I am not practicing astrology, if astrology isn't part of my daily life, uh, that channel is going to be kind of crappy and I'm, I'm not going to be able to, um, to, to read very well for people. And I think it's that part, this tending to our relationship with the daimon or you know, whatever our divinity kind of tool is, you can see it as our relationship with the daimon itself. I believe that's what we're doing when we're embracing our daimons. And I'll go into more of the how of tending to that channel um, and the relationship in the course, Embrace Your Diamond. I have to plug it again. Um, but for now, let's just go back to our why. So, you know, the how is covered in the course. Uh, I'll talk about the why now. So my why, when I don't embrace the diamond, I'm swept away by the slings and arrows of fate. Okay, so what happens? You know, that's the stick. What's the carrot? My why is... I embrace my daimon in order to increase my foreknowledge of my fate and thus be better accustomed to riding out the bumps and sharp turns of life. Okay, so my third and final why, or why not rather, uh, we get sick if we don't embrace our daimon. So this is the most extreme limb I'm going out on today, but I can't leave it out because I believe it. And uh, I've experienced it and I've, I've witnessed it in others. And you can take it or leave it, but here's, here's my thing. Um, and here's a quote to get us started uh, from James Hillman. The diamond motivates, it protects, it invents and persists with stubborn fidelity. It resists compromising reasonableness and often forces deviance and oddity upon its keeper, especially when neglected or opposed. It offers comfort and can pull you into its shell, but it cannot abide innocence. It can make the body ill. It is out of step with time, finding all sorts of faults, gaps, and knots in the flow of life, and it prefers them. Now, Hillman, maybe you didn't even notice that line, but Hillman doesn't spend long on this, but I, I really, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It can make the body ill. So why on earth would this Jiminy Cricket-like character um, make us ill? You know, surely it wants the best for us. Surely it wants to protect and serve us and make us feel warm and fuzzy. And maybe that's what your diamond does. But it's not what I've experienced. And it's not what a lot of other people that I've read about <laughs> know firsthand have experienced either. The diamond has one job, as I understand it. And that job is to remind you of why the hell you're here. What is your destiny? And it isn't interested in comfort or ease. Maybe your destiny isn't an easy one, but it's always going to be a meaningful one. So, and the diamond isn't going to 
we can't reason with it. We can't bargain with it. We can't, you know, change this necessarily. Um, but we can bring a certain level of consciousness to it and, and, and make things easier basically for ourselves. But the reason we find it so hard is when we try to ignore or neglect the daimon, it can make our bodies ill. And, and again, why would it do that? Surely that's just a bit like it's just overkill. And, and maybe it is for some people. Maybe all they need is um, they will actually hear the voice of the diamond. I had Stormy Grace on the podcast recently. I don't know if you checked out that episode, but she spoke of, um, a, you know, a voice um, and knowing that came to her. And, and it wasn't obviously very easy, but she acted on it. But I'm somebody who tends to ignore those little nudges, um, that feeling in my stomach, that tightening in my chest, that knowing that that person is just a bit dodgy. So if you're somebody like me who tends to ignore these little signs, uh, what would you do if you're a diamond? Well, you would turn up the volume. You know, for example, you know, that, that murmur in the belly becomes IBS. That, that tightening in the chest becomes angina. That person becomes a traumatic relationship. And while these things haven't actually happened to me, they have happened to people. And while I definitely am not saying that all illness or shit things that happen are your diamond being angry at you, um, I am saying that some of them could be. And I just think that for people who are very mind oriented, like myself, it's quite a job to pay attention to those more subtle signs in life, um, the signs that the diamond is most likely speaking through. And I do have a personal story, which you might have heard before, but I think it illustrates this point fairly well. So in my early 20s, I worked for a small design agency in London. It was a busy little company, but um, I thought I had everything I wanted, you know, and you've probably heard similar stories before. You know, I, I thought I had everything that society wanted me to have as well. But I don't believe it's what my diamond wanted. And I don't think that I wanted it myself and the diamond knew it. Okay, so as much as I knew things looked good on paper, um, I basically hated my life and it, it showed itself in different ways. It showed itself in my mental and physical health. I couldn't understand, for example, why I was gaining weight despite the fact that I was basically starving myself and exercising all the time. And I just kept injuring myself. And I couldn't understand why I was lashing out at my sweet parents who were putting me up at the time. I hadn't moved out just yet. And why I had to drink so much on a Friday night to the point of falling asleep on night buses, which not smart if you're a single woman in London. Anyway, somehow at some point, I, you know, it, it became too much. And finally that the message got across. And interestingly, if you want to know the astrology of it, um, I was having eclipses across my lot of diamond or close to my lot of diamond um, when I made this decision. And I made the decision to obviously quit the job um, and just change my lifestyle quite a lot. So I went freelance. Um, I stopped hanging out with certain people. I moved out of my parents' home. And thankfully, I started being much nicer to them. And things started falling into place, including my weight and health in general. Was everything dandy from then on? Of course not. Of course not. But it was a huge shift in the right direction. More often these days, my diamond acts kind of like a trickster. Um, you know, it, it's, it's usually the way that it will signal to me is something, yeah, not so pleasant <laughs> most of the time. Um, and and what, what I get from those, those signals are basically pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on. What are you neglecting to pay attention to? So as an example, I recently accidentally uh, deleted a hell of a lot of research on this very topic of the diamond. I'd done, uh, I've been doing this for probably a couple of years now, and I've deleted a bunch of it. Uh, some of it was recoverable and some of it was not. How annoying. And the first thought that came to mind, amazingly, wasn't, ah, I'm going to like throw my laptop out the window. That was definitely, you know, that was there somewhere <laughs> on some level. Um, but the thing that I did was I knew that this is a signal to pay attention to something. What am I ignoring? And over the course of the next fortnight, my issue became a lot clearer. I realized that I'd been focusing too much on the theory of the diamond, hence all this research being deleted, the philosophy, the facts. And I was ignoring the most important thing of all 
my relationship to my diamond. I wasn't tending to it. I was using it as a prop to bolster my mind's mission to comprehend the diamond. But that's not what we do with our friends, is it? Like, I don't spend my time trying to figure out the nature of my friends or my boyfriend. I spend time with them. It's a knowing that doesn't involve the mind. It means that I'm acknowledging the subjectivity of them and not just seeing them as objects, things to be dissected and, and explored. And without going into details, um, and as another example, I have a friend who, you know, spent many, of her, she basically was in a job that kind of unknowing to her conscious mind, her thinking mind wasn't right for her. Um, and she got sick. I believe it was Emmy, um, one of these um, chronic uh, disabling and um, invisible illnesses that are still quite mysterious to us. But basically this put out her out of action for you know, several years. And, you know, now thankfully she, she's on a path that is very, very fulfilling to her and, and these symptoms have gone and she's not sick anymore, but she's learned that her body, you know, what's the Bessel van der Kolk book, the body keeps the score. And, and it really does. Um, it speaks very loudly. And again, for people who are very mind oriented, this can be like, oh, you know, where, where do I begin? So, like I said, I mean, I'm saying this not to like piss everyone who's like thinking type, a very thinking type like me, but regardless, it's not an obvious voice for a lot of us. And this is what makes it so hard. And I'm just hoping to kind of reassure you because, um, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. For Socrates, for example, it wasn't a voice telling him what to do. He wasn't getting this big booming voice saying, go on, do that, talk to that person. This is what you will say. Here's the answer to the pub quiz. Um, it was telling him what not to do. And often this looked like nothing at all. So like when he was sentenced to his death, he wasn't told, yeah, just run away. Or like he wasn't given any like tips. The diamond was silent. And, and he went to his death, but he went to his death knowing in his heart that he'd followed his diamond. So, you know, again, it's not an easy path, you, you know, maybe dying, drinking hemlock, not for you, maybe not, but um, it was for Socrates and I can't help but respect him for that. So anyway, regardless of how extreme the, the signals from your diamond are, those signals from our personal diamond, they're it's personal. It's personal to us. Um, and it's a process. And again, just like with any relationship, it builds over time. And again, this is something that I will be going into in more depth on the course. So there's, there will be information about this and, and things to try. But just know that it's not necessarily going to look the same for everyone and that this is a personal thing. Okay, so let's wrap this one up. When I don't embrace my diamond, I might get ill or make dumb choices. Basically, bad things start to happen. So my why, I embrace my diamond because it makes my life a hell of a lot more easy and more enjoyable. Because even like, and I wanted to kind of qualify that easy part, it probably wasn't easy for Socrates to go to his death, but it was easier than the other thing, which is going against his destiny, basically. So I'm not sure you need any more reasons to embrace your diamond. Um, and I hope that was helpful or at least entertaining. Um, if you do want to know more about the diamond and more reasons for embracing the diamond, you can check out the course and come embrace your diamond with me. So this is a 12 week course starting May 16th um, and will be running for the next 12 weeks. Classes are live, but you can always watch the replay. So if you can't make the time zone or you've got other appointments on, on Sunday afternoons or mornings, wherever you are, um, that's cool because you'll always have the replays. And no, I don't know when I'll run it again. So just so you know, um, if I do run it again, it'll probably be, I'll charge more for it. So just so you know, warn, you are warned. And we'll be spending much more time on the how of embracing your diamond. Um, much more than I could cover today. And a good chunk of the classes will be on the astrology of the diamond. And so you've got my, you know, somewhat astrological knowledge to, to bounce ideas off. And I can look at your chart and answer any questions you have on that. So if this is something you're interested in doing, when you attend this particular class, I will be able to um, help you, you know, very closely with that. And for everyone else, there's lots and lots of non-astrological information as well. So um, tips like creating with your diamond, um, developing a spiritual practice with your diamond and much, much more. And you can find out more information about that at thecreativeintrovert.com slash 
Daimon. Okay, well, thanks again for watching and I'll catch you again soon.